He became a household name when he won America's Got Talent in 2007, and now he's one of the top draws on the Las Vegas Strip. Terry Fader and a friend join us this week for Nevada Week in person. Support for Nevada Week in person is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt and additional supporting sponsors. Terry Fader brought a unique mix to Las Vegas, delighting crowds of all ages when he arrived here more than 10 years ago. His show features ventriloquism, impressions, and music. Terry Fader, welcome to Nevada Week in person. And please introduce us to your guest. I'm Terry, and I'm Winston the impersonating turtle. I'm actually the talent in the show. That's true. Winston loves Garth Brooks, is that correct? Well, I, like all, I could do impressions of any singer. How did you come to have so many talents? Well, I was born that way. <laughs> you were. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so actually, the truth is um, that Winston, I was I was doing a Kermit the Frog puppet, and when I was on America's Got Talent, I, I asked them if I could use Kermit the Frog, and the Muppets did not give me permission. They said I could do the voice, um, but I could not use the puppet. So and I, I was wondered. trying to, yes, I was trying to find someone, and so I met this little guy, and what did you do? I said, I hold Kermit the Frog here. Right. <laughs> Why are you better than Kermit the Frog, in your opinion? Oh, because I'm the turtle. Mm, okay, we okay. have a hard shell. We're kind of like <laughs> M&Ms. <laughs> and I really like the bow tie, too. You guys go very oh, well you. together. Thank you. An interesting interview to conduct here because it's with both of you, but I want to talk about you, and obviously Winston knows you very well, so chime in whenever. Okay. I want to say happy belated Valentine's Day to you. Oh, thank and you. I bring that up because it has a significance in your personal history it that does. day. What yes. is it? Well, I mean, um, I finally found true love. I mean, oh. who doesn't want to find true love? You know, I, uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult when, when you've had some uh, trouble in, in romantic relationships in the past. And then finally, uh, in, in uh, tw 2015, I met the love of my life. Uh, we met in, in April and we're married four months later. And we are just so happy. And so I love celebrating uh, Valentine's Day because, uh, well, she's just, she's my, my love in my life. I love her. That's a different answer than I was That's expecting. Angie. Really? Though. Yes, okay. because I thought it was Valentine's Day when you had some sort of book report. Oh, you're right. See, I'd say I didn't know. I was just thinking of my wife. But of course, Lovely. why wouldn't I, right? You get no, some you're good right. You're points. right. It is. You are absolutely right. Valentine's Day. Can I tell the story? No, let me tell it. Okay, sorry. Yeah, don't hang your head. Okay, okay. So, uh, no, at Valentine. I was supposed to do a book report on Valentine's Day. And uh, back in the old days, when, as you know, I'm 56 years old. So back in 1975, we had card catalogs that were actual cards. We didn't have like all this digital stuff. I so I was supposed to do Valentine's Day and I flipped a little too far and found a book on ventriloquism. <laughs> and I, I gotta be honest, I completely forgot about the Valentine's, uh, I was supposed to do a book report on that. And I uh, forgot all about Valentine's Day and picked up ventriloquism. So it did, it was very, it, it was very impactful, but I'm glad I got to mention my wife, Angie, though. I am too. <laughs> Fast forward, and I have written down 30 is the new 40, mm -hmm. or 40 is the new 30, I got that backwards. <laughs> 40 years old is when everything kind of came together for you, how so? Well, it, it, it came together in, a, in an interesting way for me because I always assumed, in fact, I, I did an interview when I was uh, 10, uh, right after I became a ventriloquist, and they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be rich and famous. So um, even at 10, I knew I wanted to be an entertainer. And <laughs> so I, I just always assumed it was going to happen because I knew I was talented. And, and, and then when I hit 40, I started assessing my life. And I was, doing, I was doing professional ventriloquism all over the country. I was playing schools and fairs. And, uh, and at 40, I kind of thought, you know, I think this ship has sailed. I doubt there's ever gonna be any place for a 40-year-old ventriloquist to get rich and famous. And then two years later, America's Got Talent changed all of it. So, but the funny thing is, it wasn't like a depressing thing. It was more like, oh, I guess I'll just have to accept that this is my life, that I'm never gonna get rich and famous. But I was really grateful for the fact that I was one of the lucky people that got to do what I love and, and make a living at it. And uh, you know, I was performing at small venues and, and doing uh, county fairs and, and uh, elementary schools. But I thought, geez, it's much better than having to go into an office every day. And, and you know, I just, I'm not the office type. I'm really not. When was it that, do you think it was when you realized, okay, I may not be rich and famous, 
and that you let that go and then things started to click? Yeah, it, which is how it, how it tends to work, isn't it? A lot of times when you're focusing on something, uh, well, for example, a lot of times in, in romance, this is exactly what had happened with my wife, Angie. I mean, we, I had given up and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm done. I'm so done with all this. I'm done with romance. I'm done with women. And it wasn't a month later that I met the love of my life. So, but the same thing, you know, I, I had given up on ever really being rich and famous or, or even famous. I just, you know, I just wanted to have a fan base and then everything changed. So I think a lot of times the pressure that we put on ourselves for something might change. Exactly. Got <laughs> you have been living with attention deficit disorder your mm -hmm. entire life. Mm -hmm. We hear about it with children. What's it like as an adult? Different? It's different, um, it, but it's not, I, I don't really consider it a disability. Uh, I use it to my... Uh, Trust me, he definitely has ADHD. Yes, I do. How do, you, how do you recognize it? Oh, just the way, you know, sometimes his hand is shaking and there he's like, no, that's not that's not true. No, okay. No, so what what happens is my mind works way faster. The, my brain works way faster than my mouth. So a lot of the times, when I'm having a conversation with someone, um, I'm already five five thoughts ahead, and that's that's definitely ADHD. Uh, when I'm and uh, my poor wife it drives her crazy <laughs> because I can't work without something else on. So I like to have a uh, television on or I have to have music in the background. And, and I don't even notice the TV and I don't notice, but it, it's a way of kind of skewering that my brain just works at such a, a, crazy, spa a crazy speed. And so, so when I'm doing this, so, but also if you watch my show, there are, um, there's about, I'm doing about 10 things at a time. And, and I'm doing it flawlessly, and I'm doing it uh, uh, smoothly, and you, you really don't notice it. Yeah, like the fact that I'm looking at you and looking at him. Right, mm. but see, that's just a lot of practice. Yeah, thousands of hours, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness I wasn't there for that. <laughs> no, you weren't, no. Yeah, but, you know, so I, I really kind of took that, and instead of looking at it as, a, as something bad, I, I turned it into a strength. But it is, it's very difficult. It, and, uh, I never did take medication for it because I just always felt like that I don't want to to dull that part of me. I want to be able to, I do several things at a time, and then other times I get distracted and I can't focus. But uh, but you know it's it's part of it's part of having ADHD. Perhaps the puppets are the medication. Is puppets the correct term? Uh, yeah, the, actually, mannequin American. <laughs> what? <laughs> mannequin American. <laughs> Is that That's, yours? No, actually, that was written by Dan Horn. Yeah, well, a good friend of mine is a ventriloquist, and uh, he gave me that joke. Well, we would like to be politically correct. <laughs> That's here, right. That's right. No, yes. puppets is fine. Okay. Yeah, so, we're, we're puppets. We don't have feelings. <laughs> right, exactly. You are almost a year into your new show at the New York, New York, mm -hmm. uh, Who's the Dummy Now? And you said you've been quoted as saying it's a little bit different than what you've done in the past. Quote, it's kind of a whimsical origin story delving into the psychiatry of a ventriloquist. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would like you to expand upon. I mean, who are these puppets to you? <laughs> well, as I was um, assessing what I wanted my next show to be after I, I moved from the Mirage over to New York, New York, I thought it might be kind of fun to, to look at the psychological aspect of what a ventriloquist is. And I started looking at all my characters and realizing that all of those characters were kind of uh, created out of a, uh, out of a, my psyche, psych, out of my psyche, and I realized, like Winston, I, I'm his inner child. Right. <laughs> so he gets to be the little kid that sometimes I, I'm a little confused. Yeah. Like for example, I'll say, I'll say, do you like it in Vegas? Oh yeah, they're so nice. Just for me, they made turtle soup. Right. And so he doesn't understand <laughs> what turtle soup is. He thinks it was an honor, you know, and little things like that. But he's the child likeness. You know, I have a country uh, singer who is a, uh, who's, who's been divorced, you know, uh, 10 times or 12 times. Well, I've had two divorces, so I created, a, I created a puppet that's had more divorces than me. You know, I've got a sexy puppet. I've never considered myself sexy, but it's kind of that, we all, you know, any guy wants to be considered sexy, and I've never thought of myself as sexy, so what did I do? I created the sexiest puppet ever, you know. So as I began to look at the different characters that I'd created, I realized I was doing this out of my psyche. And I think, I think a lot of, well, I think the best ventriloquists do that. I think the best ventriloquists 
pick part of themselves and turn it into into a, a, a character. Wait, you you don't think women find you sexy? Well, my wife does, and that's really all that matters. But I have never thought of myself as sexy, and uh, she. But she makes sure I know that. I don't think he's sexy. Well, I hope you don't. Yeah. Considering where his hand is, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> you brought up uh, ventriloquist greats. I think that's something important to you that you like to acknowledge those who've come before you. Mm. And, and what do you think the public perception of ventriloquism is? You gotta protect it, right? We, it ebbs and flows. And um, there are times when ventriloquism is considered um, uh, valid entertainment for all ages. You know, Edgar Bergen back in the um, in the 1930s, with uh, he had a, I think it was 20, 20 or 30 years, he had a, a radio show. And then you had um, other ventriloquists that came along, there were more children's entertainers. And then you had uh, Soap with Jay Johnson, who it was definitely an adult entertainer. And so um, by the time I was went on America's Got Talent, the uh, we were in one of the ebbs or the flows where everyone thought the ventriloquism was just for kids. And I wanted to be one of the ones who changed that perception. Not that my show is dirty, it's not. Right. But I, but I, my, my show is written for the adult intellect. So my jokes are, are um, well thought out and are clever. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of ventriloquists are corny. Right. <laughs> and, and Terry's not, uh, uh, Terry's not corny. You know, you, I'm supposed to, Terry's not corny. Right. Yeah, you, you forgot who just said that. Right. So uh, but, <laughs> I'm not corny. So. But, but and, I imagine some of your jokes might go over your head. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. In fact, all of them do. Because you are childlike. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm a turtle, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you keep bringing up your wife. Does Winston have a romantic interest? Well, yeah, there's a, there's a lady that I'm interested in. Her name is Tiffany. Tiffany? Yeah, a turtle, a lady turtle. Oh. Tiffany, Tiffany the turtle. Yeah. And does she live in Las Vegas? She does. <laughs> and it's not working out or what? Well, I'm still trying. <laughs> okay, all right, well, best of luck to you. <laughs> I like in one of your interviews, you said, the minute that there is something stupid in the room that you can agree on, comment on it. Yeah, that's absolutely true, and that's really, but I think that's what all, all ventrilo, I mean, not ventrilo, it was all comedians do. Okay. You know, anytime something doesn't make sense, we always try to find the humor in it, which is what makes it so difficult uh, in in a woke society because you know comedians um, we think outside the box and sometimes if you want to be funny sometimes you're gonna say something that might be offensive and it really makes it difficult to um, to be funny and be in a comedian when when people are so they, they wear their feelings outside so um, comedy used to be off limits exactly and I think it should be I think it's I think we need to go back to comedy being off limits and if you know Couple rapid fire because okay, we are running out of time. A true Las Vegas experience is okay. I, what, what do you think? A um, let me see. I'm, I, I I wrote some notes. Where is that? Oh oh, a true. Okay. Uh, oh, no one knows. They're always too drunk to remember. Oh, no, really? <laughs> you think so? <laughs> there, I think I think the true Las Vegas experience, and this is what I used to do, uh, is breakfast at 4 a.m. after going to see a couple of shows with your friends and uh, and ha you know going out and gambling and having fun. That's a, that's the Las Vegas experience, don't you think? And like steak and eggs for maybe seven bucks, something good like that. Uh, I like ham and eggs though. Mmm, <laughs> Nevada's most important asset. That's right. Is. <laughs> oh, oh, Nevada. What is Nevada's? Uh, oh, a, a turtle who can do impressions. Duh. Oh, well, you uh, what was I thinking? <laughs> I would say the sense of community. Uh, we have a really great sense of community here in Vegas, don't you think? Uh, do you feel that? You, I do. Yeah. I really do. You know, when we came together after the shooting in, in October a few years ago, and, and every Christmas when we have the toy drive, we have one of the best toy drives in the country. I love it. It's great. Terry Fader, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you can catch Terry's show, Who's the Dummy Now, at New York, New York, along with Winston. And you can watch the latest episode of Nevada Week anytime online at VegasPBS.org slash Nevada Week, or tune in Sunday at 5.30 or Tuesday at 7.30. Did you get those times? Thank you for joining us.